Welcome everyone. In this video, we're going to take a look at creating a Yara rule for the PE Compact 2 Packer. So we'll be creating this rule based off of the opcodes or the bytes of the malware, the executable, in order to generate the rule body, the, the, the rule logic. Um, I chose PE Compact 2 because it's a, a very popular packer. You'll still encounter it quite regularly in dealing with malware. And so it's just a good one to, to not only be able to detect, but then also um, to, to be able to understand how to unpack. Now, we're not going to talk a lot about the whole process of packing and unpacking. Um, I've covered that in other videos here on YouTube. I also have a full course on Pluralsight. So uh, that's a, a subject that can get um, quite, you know, quite detailed and, and quite complex quite quickly. Uh, so we won't be focusing on that here. Instead, we're just going to talk a little bit about, you know, the general packing process. And then, of course, more specifically focus on the creation of the Yara rule. Now, in this case, PE Compact 2 is a well-known packer, so you'll likely be able to find, um, well, you will be able to find rules that exist out there already to help provide coverage. As you can see on platforms such as VirusTotal, it already has detection built in. So in this case, I came across a sample, and I was just looking for any old sample. I don't actually know much about this particular sample. I just wanted to find something that was packed with PE Compact 2. And so this tagging done by virus total can really help with that. The approach I want to take though, is if we were creating this rule from scratch from new, like there was no existing coverage and, and we were going to create the first rule in order to detect this packer. So that's really the perspective I want to have just so we can talk through the creation process. Um, we will talk about some of the other rules are out there and, and those certainly can serve as, um, you know, a, a foundation to craft your own rules, to convert maybe from one platform to another. Or, or simply just to use as already built in detection. Now, when it comes to virus total, even though we have the, the tagging here in the interface, we don't necessarily know how virus total is providing this detection. And I don't believe they reveal that information anywhere. Um, also, more on the unfortunate side of things, when it comes to wanting to do a little bit more hunting, let's say we wanted to search all of virus totals data for anything that was tagged with PE Compact 2, well, we can click on that, but what happens is you have to have either be under a free trial or, or you have to have an enterprise account, right? So there are a lot of platforms and I'm sure internal tooling that would allow you once you've, you've created this detection to be able to identify those samples. Um, but in this case, you know, virus total is just a little off limits because I don't want to use, I don't ever use anything in these videos that isn't free or provides some free tier. Uh, abuse.ch is a good alternative. And what you can do with abuse.ch is you can go to the Yara Ify that abuse.ch platform or part of their application, and you can add Yara rules uh, to their, you know, to their platform. Let me see here if I can find the, I think it's Yara Hub. Um, and then that can start to scan going forward, right? It, it doesn't provide at least nothing that I've come across a, a retro hunt, a, a you know, the ability to upload a, a virus or I'm sorry, a YAR rule and search backwards across, across the corpus. It's only going to be applying your YAR rules to new things submitted going forward. Something like VirusTotal has that power. You can go to VirusTotal and has an extensive ability to perform live and, and retro hunts. Um, but here you can see now that I've added my signature, as well as there's plenty of other YAR rules here, uh, this is now providing detections moving forward and if we wanted to look at those detections, we could just see what the results were. And now we'd have a series of files that may or may not be related, right? That's what can make this at this level challenging because we're detecting based off of the packer. Uh, we don't really know a whole lot about what, who is using it, why they're using it, what is the underlying thing that they packed, right? So really, again, the focus on detecting the packer is that that can help us unpack it and you know get to that next stage. Okay, so there's some options here. Uh, Yara FI is one such option. Virus Total is another. Particularly if you have an enterprise subscription, then you've got the full power of Virus Total sort of sort of at your fingertips. Okay, so what about the binary? Well, uh, I'm going to open this up in IDA. I'm using the free version of IDA, the latest version as of the time of this recording. So that should be like 8.3. Um, the only thing I've modified is I've closed some windows to just provide a little bit better real estate here, make the fonts a little bit larger without getting things too crowded. And if you look under options colors, uh, I just changed the theme to the dark theme. That's just the theme that I like. We're at the entry point. You can see that here, it's annotated start. Uh, and 
some other modifications now that I've made to this particular listing view is if you go to general options, I've added the line prefixes and we've got opcode bytes. Those are already there. So maybe I did something wrong, but uh, seven, eight opcode bytes is usually a pretty good number. And, and what's that, what that, how that modifies the display is you get line prefixes. These are the virtual addresses. And for this video, the more important part is we get these opcode bytes, right? What are the opcode bytes? Well, you can see to the right, those are the, dis those are the, the, that's the value, the data that represents the instructions, the instructions that the CPU will execute during the program's execution. So this is the entry point. You can see we have bytes B8, 7, 4, C4. And if we looked at this file in a hex editor, here it is. That segment typically is at an offset of 400 hex on disk. And there we have the bytes B8, 7, 4, C4, and so on. Right, so so all Ida is doing, well, not all Ida, Ida is doing a lot, but uh, the essence of what it's doing is parsing this file, understanding what these segments mean, and in this case, this is the code segment, and then going to the entry point and beginning the process of disassembly. So we can now use that in order to create our Yara rule. And what we're looking for at this point, I'm gonna hit the space bar and toggle this back to the graph view. Um, what we're looking at at this point is, are there unique enough patterns in these instructions in order to create a YAR rule? And I would say, yeah, certainly, if we look at these first few instructions, they are unique enough that it would probably create a pretty good YAR rule. Um, now, how you recognize that just takes time. I think it's one of the parts of Yara rule writing that becomes a little bit more art uh, because you have to have a, an understanding, you have to have looked at enough code, to, to kind of develop that feel for what makes it unique or not. So I can say that there aren't a lot of programs that I have looked at over the years that immediately start with this sequence of instructions. And what's unique about this, there's some structures here that you may or may not recognize. For example, the FS0, um, this is, what this is doing is essentially creating a, an entry for an exception handler. And this XOR EAX, that will, anytime you XOR a register with itself, it zeroes out that register, and then you see it moves into EAXD referenced ECX. Well, ECX is never set, doesn't matter, right? Taking whatever's in that register at the time of execution and trying to dereference essentially a null pointer will cause an exception. And so this code is then in a sense, well, it is creating a custom exception handler that's gonna go here. Right. And if you're not familiar with structured exception handling, you can look it up. SEH, again, for the purposes of this video, we're not going to get into all the details. Maybe I'll make a video of that a little bit later. Um, so that means that not only are these structures kind of unique and that why, why would a program immediately generate a new exception handler and then create an exception, but that also what follows beyond that likely is not going to get executed, right? Because that exception handler is going to kick in. So this code is unnecessary. And we can kind of tell uh, whenever you're looking at code that, that is, is possibly junk or that's going to get overwritten, it's just you, you see instructions that you don't typically recognize or see very often. You might see a sequence of instructions that just doesn't make sense. For example, out SD, in SD, I don't see those very often. Um, ARPL, especially ARPL being called uh, a couple of times, just a very uncommon instruction. And just looking at this sequence, this doesn't look like code that does that even makes sense and likely it'll cause an exception or an error itself. Um, so that really means in my mind that these, these first few instructions here are pretty good candidates for a signature. Now, one thing that you might not recognize in the code, but if you were to look at this binary using strings, or if you were to, um, you know, just, I guess in this case, look at it in a hex editor, but I first noticed it looking at the binary with strings and then trying to find where that string was located, you'll see PE compact two is one of those strings. And in fact, if we look at these bytes, five, zero, four, five, four, three, those are the ASCII characters uh, for that string. They come as part of the actual instructions here at the entry point, right? So let's just keep that in mind. Five, four, five, zero, four, five, four, three, go back to Ida. 
and there they are, right? Five zero four five four three. So that's the string PE compact two, and that actually goes down to this these bytes here six three seven four three two, and then there's the null byte. And we can go back to our hex editor, and one easy way to do that is just to highlight this over here on the right hand column, and then you can see those bytes highlighted for you in the hex view. Uh, so seven four three two. Now it may look like these bytes don't flow sequentially, but if we switch back to that linear view, move out of the graph view, you'll see there is the beginning and there's the end. So there's our string PE compact two. And that's just what it looks like when it's disassembled. It just happens to disassemble cleanly. Um, so that actually could become a part of the signature and I'm gonna make it part of the signature in this case, right? So these bytes here, as well as this. Um, now, when it comes to creating the signature, when we're also looking at code, I want to look for things that could vary between samples, right? At this point, maybe, maybe I'm not competent enough in my ability to create this. So maybe I go look for other PE Compact 2 samples and I build up that corpus to see what are the instructions here and of, of those, which ones change? Well, I did that. And what you're going to find is that it's it's likely just this this location, which is where the exception handler is going to redirect execution. That might that's going to change between samples, but but how it gets there, building that record and and, and triggering the exception, that's all going to be consistent. So if we look at the opcode bytes, there's our address four five c four seven four four five c four seven four. We can wildcard those bytes to make our to make our YAR rule a little bit more resilient, right? To be able to accommodate for that variation in that location um, and still then detect something that's been packed with PE Compact 2, right? So we're gonna include that in that creation. Now, uh, before we get to the Yara, I did mention there's tools like Detect It Easy, and you'll see that it has right here, very first thing, PE Compact, so it has a signature. So we could take a look at the signatures database to you know, study a little bit about, they, they actually have quite a few signatures for PE Compact 2 and older versions of it. Uh, we could look at the signatures and, and, and understand how they crafted the signature that obviously matches on the sample and maybe use that to be the foundation for our Yara or port it over. You'd have to look at the license information. Imagine it's pretty open in order to then uh, to do that. So like, like I said at the beginning, this is a well-known, there are lots of rules. In fact, if you go to Yara, if I, there's other PE Compact 2 signatures out there. Um, so I wanted to look at this from, from the lens of it's something new, all right? So we just gotta pretend there with me for a little bit. Okay, so where does that leave us? Well, in this case, we've already looked at the code. We've thought through this entry point, which happens to be you know fairly unique, fairly distinct provide some good opportunities for creating our signature. And then in order to create the signature, I'm just gonna move over to a text editor, I'm going to use the PE module. So we're gonna import that typical metadata, strings information. Uh, a colleague once recommended to me to, to put in as a comment, the code, not only the op codes, but then the in disassembled instructions. And I think that's a really good approach because then we can see well, you could see, if you just grab my rule from the internet somewhere, you could see exactly what these bytes are. You wouldn't have to go find the sample. Oh, and that's something else I should add here. I'll do this on the fly as a to-do. Uh, let's see, we would add this like like sample and then the, the SHA-2 or the MD5 or something. So I'll make sure to add that there. Just good information to have. So if you wanted to you know, confirm the rule matches, you could do that. If you wanted to look at the code or the, the sample that it was based off of, you could do that. Um, and then a little bit more granular level, you can actually see the instructions that it was built off of. So from here, we just have to create a variable. If we want to, we want to define a hex pattern. You know, you, you use the open and close parentheses, and then it's just the opcodes. And I like to add a space in between there just to make it a little bit easier to visually parse. The as you can see, the question mark allows you to wildcard each part of a hex digit, right? So a byte is eight bits. That's two hex digits. 
each hex digit is four bits, right? So we could wildcard just four bits of a byte or two of them to wildcard the full byte. So I, I mentioned in that pre, you know, in that, and we were looking at this in IDA, this address right here, this is probably going to change. It does change. So we want to wildcard that out. So this accounts for those four bytes. And then everything else is just the op codes, the, the byte pattern as they flow, as I want them to be detected. And again, you can see that up above here. The condition then is fairly straightforward, uh, pretty standard to see a uint 16. So what this is doing is saying, okay, dereference um, a word value or a two byte value at the beginning of the file. And it should be 4D5A. And if we look at that in hex editor, that's the magic part of the magic bytes for a PE file, 4D5A. And then we tell the condition to look at the entry point of the PE file. So this is why I imported that PE file so that that module could calculate where that entry point is for me. And then it just simply starts to match, right? So it starts to look byte by byte, wildcarding those bytes. And if that sequence matches, then we know we have a match. And that's all there is to this Yara rule. Now to test it, again, quite straightforward. Uh, Yara installed in Windows. We have the Yara rule, and then we have our sample file. And so now we can run that. And with any luck, if we had any syntax errors or problems with the rule itself, those would be omitted here. When we have a match, we have the name of the rule and the matching file. So of course, for this video, I made sure to make it work. And here we have the results that I was looking for. Okay, so there you have it. That's the, uh, you know, prop, uh, brief process that I go through in order to create Yara rules. Uh, of course, not everything is always going to be super straightforward. Uh, it's not always going to be byte patterns. It might be strings. It might be a combination thereof. Uh, lots of ways to create Yara to create good and accurate detections. The other thing I haven't talked about here is how do I further test my rule? How do I know if it's going to create a bunch of false positive noise? Uh, and so that's something that, uh, again, to consider, I'm not going to cover it in this video just for the sake of time, probably do another video on that. But um, it's good to have uh, a corpus of known samples. Let's just say you copied every executable off of a fresh installation of Windows. Well, I wouldn't expect anything to be packed with PE Compact 2. So if I ran my rule against that corpus and I got a match, then I would want to look at that sample uh, and my rule and figure out what's going on. It might be a true positive. Maybe there actually is something that's packed with PE Compact 2. I'd, I'd be quite surprised. But, you know, like that's the, that's the process of going through and doing that further testing before I start to deploy. Um, you could put it in Yara FI, which I have, and start to look at the samples that are matched there, although that's now sort of in a, in a production environment, so to speak. And so I, I would, you know, probably have, or I typically have more localized testing before I, I go to that step. But again, something to consider and, and likely it'll be a, a video that I'll cover here in the near future. So hope you enjoy. Please leave feedback, comments, if you like it, don't like it, things that I could cover better. And, uh, and I'll talk to you all in the next video.